Okay, so, um, one of the concerns of the uh, environmental humanities has been environmental justice. I'll come back a bit more to what we mean by that. Um, and it occurred to me that actually archaeology is well placed to answer questions of, to give some kind of time depth to thinking about environmental justice um, and looking at how it's changed through time using the actual, the physical evidence of um, what we might call environmental archaeology, um, bioarchaeology in particular. And it just so happened that I was doing some work on some material from London, um, mostly cesspits, which are one of my favourite things in the world, um, and had access to uh, some parasites, uh, or some parasite eggs in those samples. And I thought, well, maybe I can weave this in, see where it goes. Um, this was a bit less successful than I would have liked, for <laughs> reasons that will soon become clear. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk to you uh, fairly quickly about environmental justice and how that fits into the environmental humanities. Um, introduce parasitic worms to you, just in case you're not familiar with them. Uh, look at some of the sources of evidence that we have, um, some of the many, many problems with the evidence that we have, um, and then a bit of a temporal review looking at British archaeology, um, and you'll immediately begin to see one of the first problems from this slide uh, that I've rolled together prehistory and the Romano-British period uh, in one thing and then considered the medieval and post-medieval as separate things. Um, there's obviously an issue of temporal resolution. Um, and then ask, can we draw any conclusions? And the answer is a qualified yes. Spoiler alert. Um, so environmental justice uh, really emerged, um, well, in the 1980s um, and has become one of the things that's fed into environmental humanities. Uh, it recognises that environmental burdens disproportionately affect certain communities. Um, so it's a story that we kind of know in our heads, but um, it's often not formally uh, recognised that for various reasons, different communities carry um, these burdens of uh, environmental problems, in particular with relation to health, um, access to good food, access to clean water. Um, so it, it identifies an overlap between social, cultural and environmental concerns. Environmental justice in many ways was pushing back against conservation biology, which wanted to conserve, um, or the conservation movement in general, which wanted to conserve nature as a thing without people. Um, but quite often people have been an integral part of nature for millennia, and many of our ecosystems have developed with people in them. So environmental justice is concerned with things like that as well. Um, so as an example, a key area of concern in the modern world for environmental justice might be uh, the use of rainforests in South America as an offset for carbon emissions by companies in the West. Um, and quite often that's done at the expense of the people who live there. They become excluded from the rainforest. But of course the rainforest ecosystem has uh, evolved over millennia with those people in them, with things like controlled burning, with hunting, and inevitably not only is there the social damage of taking people out of um, areas that they've been able to exploit for, for generations, um, but there's also the environmental damage that suddenly there's a niche and that gets filled by something else. Um, so parasitic worms are a valid source of evidence for environmental justice because they, their transmission generally relates either to poor environmental conditions, uh, low hygiene, poor quality water, um, or to poor food, um, in particular undercooked meat. So we have uh, some of the most common types, and I apologise, I am going to be using a few Latin names in this talk. I will try to remember to uh, use the English names as well. Um, but of concern to us, Ascaris lumbricoides, which is uh, both that one there, these are the eggs, incidentally, that one there, and the one at the very top, um, the fertilised and unfertilised forms of their eggs, uh, roundworm. If you take one thing from this talk today, it is do not Google images, Google image search Ascaris lumbricoides, um, because you will not eat for a day or two afterwards. Um, Trachuris trachiura, the whipworm, which is the one in the top centre there, uh, fairly common find on well, commonish find. 
Enterobius vermicularis pinworm. This is one that, uh, to this day, children in the UK very commonly get. In fact, it's estimated that the prevalence is about 40% of the school age population. Um, so it is really very common. And hymen, Hymenolopsis nana, the dwarf tape one. They're all transmitted uh, through soil or through water or through food that's contaminated, but they're not, um, they're not part of the... Uh, they haven't used the animal that you're eating as an intermediate host. Um, others, like Tania sagittina, uh, that's the one dead center, um, the beef pork tapeworm, uh, that comes from undercooked beef or pork. Um, Diphilobotrium latum, which is not on there, um, but I do have some pictures of that later. Fish tapeworm, that's a particularly nice one, comes from undercooked freshwater fish, grows to 20 meters long in... <laughs> In its host, that's us. Um, and Dicrocelium dendriticum, the lancet liver fluke, um, which is also not pictured, um, which is really only an opportunistic parasite of humans. Um, the sources of evidence that we have are mummies. They're probably the best source of evidence because you have uh, your parasite eggs within an individual. Um, it might be that they're mummies in the Egyptology sense of mummies, or they might be mummies more in the Lindo man, um, or um, Ertzi, uh, the ice man sense of mummies. Um, and certainly both Ertzi and Lindo man were subject to paras parapsychological analysis. The second best source of evidence in terms of uh, relating the parasites to individuals is uh, sediment samples from around the sacrum of a, bur of a burial. Um, and uh, King Richard III is probably the most famous example of one of those that's been done. Um, thirdly, coprolites. Uh, there was a lot of work in York in particular looking at coprolites um, through the 80s and 90s. Vast, the vast majority of coprolites, so these are preserved turds, um, the vast majority of coprolites found on archaeological sites are actually dog coprolites, um, identified as such, um, because they've got lots of small splinters of broken bone in them. Um, but there are some human coprolites out there, most famously the Lloyd's Bank turd, um, which I believe you can go and visit in York to this day. And finally, and this is the realm in which I'm working, sediment samples of latrine soils, cesspits, and other deposits that look a bit iffy. Um, so the real evidential problem that we have is that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and quite often, we're looking for absences to try and create a narrative. Um, some eggs have very, very fragile, are very fragile. Um, so Enterobius vermicularis, the one that I said that 40% of children in Britain potentially have, um, doesn't preserve at all in the archaeological record. We don't have a single one from Britain. Uh, the eggs of some species hatch within the host, um, so they never enter the feces, um, or they hatch immediately on defecation, so something would have had to have gone wrong uh, biologically with the egg um, for them to be preserved. Um, and there's a very small size of the sample relative to the donor sediment. So parasite eggs are uh, around about 50 microns in their largest dimension, um, so that's 0 0.05 millimetres. Um, the sediments that I'm looking at come in 10 litre buckets like that. The chances reducing uh, 10 litres of sediment down to a microscope slide um, are that I'm, some things are going to get missed out. Um, so we do take multiple samples per, multiple subsamples per sample, but even so, there's always a risk that something's got missed out. Um, there's a, a difficulty relating eggs to infected individuals, um, particularly if you're looking at cesspits, things like that. Uh, difficulty relating the number of eggs to the prevalence of the infection. Um, parasites, many of them produce prodigious numbers of eggs. We're talking millions of eggs in a day. Um, but they don't always produce millions of eggs. So it might be somebody with an infection goes to the toilet, no eggs are passed. Or it might be they go to the toilet, 20,000 eggs are passed. Um, and it depends on things like the, the time of the day. Um, so we don't know, you know, just because there's a lot of one species eggs in a sample, it doesn't mean that lots of people had that infection. It just means somebody had that infection. Uh, and as you'll see, there is very uneven coverage of the available data, um, both temporally and geographically, which is really a reflection of who's been doing the work uh, in the UK. So. Um, 
<coughs> this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, there are almost certainly more pieces of work out there. In particular, Parasite X quite often crop up on pollen slides, and I've not looked at very many of those, but our earliest example uh, is um, on a pollen slide at Goldcliffe, um, and that's Trichurus, the whipworm. Um, don't Google that one either. Um, and then similarly, the next oldest uh, wall pollen in Somerset, uh, Heather Tinsley identified uh, Trichurus uh, there in a Neolithic deposit on a pollen slide. Uh, there's a difficulty with those, two in particular. Um, Trichuris uh, comes as a genus, has various forms that uh, infect various different um, species, and the, the species that infects pigs is very, very similar looking, the morphology of the egg, to the species that infects humans. Um, so it may well be that we're not looking at human parasitism there, uh, and there's simply not a good way of knowing. Um, Breen Down, we're a bit more confident about that. Bone Jones did that work, um, looking at pits uh, and found Trochurus and Ascaris. That's the one that you definitely must not Google. Uh, Bone Jones also looked at Lindoman, um, so very obviously a human infection there. Um, and again, found Whipworm and Roundworm Ascaris. Uh, there's a bit more work been done for the Romano British period. Um, Probably the really interesting thing there, we start to get food-related parasites. Uh, the tapeworms, the pork or beef tapeworm, Tania, and fish tapeworm, the Philobotrium latum uh, in Southwark in the Roman period. Um, Ribchester is the one of those that is a Roman <coughs> fort, and although Trochurus and Ascaris are present, they're not present in very high quantities. There's only really one sample. Loads of samples were looked at, uh, only one sample had any great quantity of them. Um, so potentially there might be something about the, the people that were stationed at that fort that means that they don't have that great parasite burden. And it might be something to do with uh, the improved levels of sanitation in the Roman period. However, Piers Mitchell at Cambridge has looked at this throughout uh, the Roman Empire and his finding is that actually Roman levels of sanitation don't seem to have done very much for preventing parasites. Um, unsurprisingly, loads more for the medieval period. Even less surprisingly, if you know anything about the history of environmental archaeology in Britain, loads of it's in York. Um, so we've got uh, Trichurus and Ascaris, the two that are transmitted through dirty water, exposure to soil, contaminated food, um, prevalent at at least seven sites in York. Um, Hymenolopsis, the dwarf tapeworm, again, also um, transmitted through dirty water. Um, and it's there at Pontefract, it's there at Winchester, um, it's there in Northern Ireland at Deer Park Farms, uh, which is quite a high status Christian site. Um, it's there in Worcester in a barrel latrine that James Craig looked at, uh, Southwark, um, actually in the water of the River Fleet as well, some work done in the early 1980s by Peter Boyd. Um, and even Richard III uh, had Ascaris, um, as Piers Mitchell found. Um, the in an interesting one there, Staxton Motel, which is way up in rural North Yorkshire. Um, they looked at, in that case, they were looking at inhumations, um, sacral samples, and they didn't find any parasites. So it might be that because they were quite a rural community, uh, they just weren't exposed to these kind of parasites that proliferate in dense urban centres. But what, of course, you will realise is there's simply not... We might have missed... Um, they, the parasites might have been missed in the samples. Um, that's not a very uh, rigorous <coughs> data set. Um, and finally, uh, in London specifically, the post-medieval work seems to be focused in London. Um, again, this is really an artefact of who's doing the work. Um, which is basically me or Piers Mitchell and his PhD students. Um, so Spitalfields, uh, the Cambridge group looked at two sites around there and found uh, Trachyrus and Ascaris. These were very low status um, sites of the 17th century. Um, no great surprise that in amongst all that sort of uh, post-medieval urban filth, uh, Trachyrus and Ascaris proliferate. Prescott Street, um, again, quite low status sites. Um, lovely collection of uh, 
freshwater fish, tapeworm, eggs from that. Uh, 100 minerals, again, uh, eastern fringes of London, kind of a peri-urban site, um, because at this point it's being used uh, as a dumping ground for things taken out of the city. It's just outside the city wall. Um, and in that case, uh, parasites c contracted through eating um, seem to be uh, relatively numerous. They're appearing in multiple samples. That's the best I can say for relatively numerous. Um, St. Olaf's, interestingly, just south of the river, um, similar sort of date, 1600s going into the 1800s. So far, I haven't found any parasites there. Um, and there's some quite promising cesspit deposits, which are full of, uh, the stuff's full of phytoliths and bran and all the things you would expect from uh, some good urban poop, um, but no parasites. So it may be that there's something particular about that site, um, which may be because it's a slightly higher status site than uh, the ones named above. So I've kind of raced through this and come to the end. Um, the problem is that the data are so sparse um, that it's very difficult to draw any reliable conclusions. So far more studies are needed. And maybe my primary purpose standing in front of you today is just to say, hey, have you thought about having parasites looked at? Even if it's not a very promising site, um, it's quite good to fill out the negative results as well. Um, however, uh, Piers Mitchell was able to note that uh, food-related tapeworm and flukes uh, were not present, it, it would, not present in King Richard III, um, but they certainly were, other people have noticed that they certainly were pre present in London in the medieval period. Um, so obviously his food was being cooked very nice, very well for him. Um, and in fact, uh, we see from Peter Boyd's study that uh, London, the river fleet was already very filthy by the 14th century. Um, already quantities of uh, these uh, Ascaris and Tricurus eggs floating around in the river then. Um, so certainly if you're coming into contact with the eggs, um, if you're coming into contact with the water, you would be coming into contact with eggs. Um, and there we have a medium for transmission. Um, okay, so uh, quick final thoughts. Parasites, I still stand by the idea that parasites are a valid way of exploring uh, issues of environmental justice. But what I have not found is a point, and it surely exists, a point where um, conditions of sanitation become so much greater in one group of the population that they no longer have this parasite burden. Um, certainly in the days of King Richard III, it wasn't then, but moving forward, we do expect to find that. The data just aren't available though, um, which when I wrote my abstract, I hoped they would be. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.